it's not unlike the mafia where the only loyalty that these families can count on is either blood preferably or marital ties so they use marital ties to establish alliances to defuse enmities so people who are fighting each other on the battlefield one year would end up in-laws a few years later Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History podcast. My name is Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. Today's chat is with ancient historian James Rom, whose specialist subject is the period immediately after the death of Alexander the Great and is described as the Wars of the Successors. Many of you may not be familiar with this period, but don't worry, we introduced that world and as you've heard from James at the top there, there was a series of dynasties that battle each other for the supremacy of Greece, the Eastern Mediterranean, Egypt and Asia and is reminiscent of organised crime. James's new book is about Demetrius, head of one of the five families who dominated, and who had the quite fantastic nickname of the Besieger. We talk about whether Alexander was murdered, the world Demetrius was born into, we also talk about Pyrrhus of Epirus, a general who defeated the Romans, but at such a cost he gave his name to the Pyrrhic victory. Now coming up on the podcast, The Film Club is out on Tuesday, where director Tim Hewitt and I discuss the Oscar-winning Argo, directed by Ben Affleck. The movie is about the Iran hostage crisis, starring Affleck, John Goodman and Alan Arkin. I've also got Napoleon's invasion of Russia, the Hundred Years' War, plus much, much more. Links to all we discuss are in the show notes. Please do subscribe to get upcoming episodes in your feed and rate and review if you can. But in the meantime, I'll hand you over to me talking to James Rom on Demetrius and the successors of Alexander. James Rom, welcome to the podcast. It's a real pleasure and an honour, I have to say, to have you on because I'm a huge fan of yours, having read Ghost on the Throne and now Demetrius, Sacker of Cities. So thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, and this this book is uh, Demetrius, uh, who's a fantastic character from the Wars of the Successes, which I've got to admit is a bit of a sweet spot for me in the world of ancient history because it's it's so fascinating. And I think the, the whole Game of Thrones thing has slightly been overused, so I, I, I shouldn't have even mentioned that. But it is uh, this period of history in the immediate aftermath of the death of Alexander is, well, not very well known, but hugely fascinating. You've studied this period for a long time. Did it draw you in or did you sort of end up by accident? Why, why do you, why, why is this period of history so interesting to you? Well, uh, you know, I don't mind the Game of Thrones analogy. Uh, I think it's a fitting analog in some ways in that you have five contestants for power for, for much of the period after Alexander's death and going right through to the 280s and 270s BC. So, you know, five contestants, each of whom had different advantages on their side, and each of whom was trying to find found a dynasty, hand power down to sons and then to grandsons. So it really is a lot like the Game of Thrones. And that's what drew me in, the the complexity and the excitement and the amount that was at stake, because really the entire ancient world was up for grabs. Alexander had conquered the Persian Empire, added it to his Greek Empire, and controlled the entire world from, you know, what is now the Adriatic to um, to the Indus River. A hugely consequential period. And lots of fascinating characters, people, you know, so colorful that I just could not get over it. And when I first learned about it at a fairly late stage in my career, I was just obsessed. That's wonderful to hear, actually. It really is. Uh, And it's interesting that that's late on in your career as well. So your book opens and um, focusing obviously on Demetrius, who is this hugely attractive figure from the ancient world. The book opens with him as a very young man, a teenager, really, with his father, Antigonus, who's a generation above Alexander, and Demetrius himself is a generation below. And and this is in the wake of Alexander's death. So I just wanted to 
um, for the listeners might be a little bit unfamiliar with the with what was going on in the immediate aftermath of Alexander's death. And also, I wondered, is it worth us even discussing Alexander's death itself? Was it murder? Was it illness? Yeah, we could talk about that, although there's no conclusions that we can come to. We have two different bodies of evidence, and one suggests that it was a poisoning, and the other that it was a protracted illness, a, a fever of some kind, or perhaps an infection. So we can't really decide between those two sources, those two bodies of, of evidence. And um, we're at such a far remove that any investigation has to be inconclusive. So you don't come down on, on one side or the other then? No, although I I lean more towards the illness theory than assassination. I wrote about this a, a while ago, and my reasoning is that the generals who were under Alexander, most of whom then became the successors in the in the wars of the successors, didn't have anything to gain from his death. In fact, they had everything to gain from his continuing to stay alive. So it's hard to find a motive. The motive that our ancient sources give is that there was a, a fear on the part of Antipater, who was back in Macedon, that he was on the chopping block and that he collaborated with Aristotle, perhaps, and uh, poisoned Alexander by way of his son, Cassander. So that's a fairly elaborate conspiracy theory. And as we know from recent experience, Conspiracy theories tend not to have much substance. They get generated very easily, but they're they're not often demonstrably valid. Okay, well, we, you've mentioned Cassandra. We'll talk about him in a bit. I don't like him. I'm not a fan of his. But the, the world in so Alexander, when he dies, he's he's rather unhelpfully gives the line when uh, just as he's about to die, who who are you leaving the empire to to the strongest? That's very unhelpful, isn't it? So, so, so in the aftermath, you have all these successors who are desperate to have a piece of the pie, aren't they? That's right. There was an heir to Alexander's throne, his son, his infant son, who was born posthumously and was immediately dubbed Alexander the Fourth. Well, we we call him the Fourth. The Greeks called him Alexander. And Alexander also had a half-brother who was, unfortunately, a mental invalid. And those two were both crowned his successors. So you had two kings in the wake of his death, neither of whom was able to exercise power. And a board of regents, four men were set up as the caretakers of the empire, a recipe for power vacuum, fragmentation, rivalry among the regions, and so on. It, it was a disastrous situation, and everyone involved knew that it was unsustainable. So very quickly, they began to tear off pieces or, or establish power bases from which they could operate as um, independent rulers. And Demetrius is, he's a little bit young at this stage, but his father is, becomes a, quite a significant player, which he hadn't been during the, during the, during Alexander's invasion of, of the Persian Empire, had he? No, he had been sidelined by Alexander, speaking of Antigonus One Eye, who, as you said, was a generation older than Alexander. He was in his sixties at the time of Alexander's death. And Alexander tended not to trust people of that generation, his father's generation, basically. He liked to work with his peers. So Antigonus had been sidelined to a, a rear guard post in what is now Turkey. But he had enormous talent and ambition and didn't like being sidelined. But as soon as the chance came to step forward and, and claim his place in the limelight, he did so and relied largely on his son Demetrius who was only a teenager at the time Alexander died, to do his his bidding, carry out some of his missions, and serve as his the public face of what he hoped would be his dynasty. And they had quite a, Demetrius and his father Antigonus had quite a close relationship, didn't they? Which is a little bit unusual during that time. 
Yes. Plutarch remarks on how rare it was for a father who was trying to be a dynast to trust his son because sons regularly bumped off fathers in this era. And he tells a story about how Demetrius came home from a hunting, carrying his spear and just walked blithely into the throne room or into the room where Antigonus was holding court and kissed his father hello and nobody was afraid there there was no fear of assassination and he thinks that that is rather remarkable for that time so yeah the antigonid family antigonus and his descendants had a reputation for warmth and loyalty that was uncommon among dynasts and in fact plutarch says that down to the fifth generation in the second century bc there were no assassinations in the family line and so with the existence of alexander the fourth and his well i guess his his half brother when you say he's mentally deficient does that mean he do we know what that really means no it's not clear what he suffered from that made him unable to rule We do hear stories about him speaking and reacting, you know, rationally. But we also hear that he suddenly became violent in an inappropriate way. So I think most um, scholars assume that he had a, um, you know, developmental deficiency of some kind. The rumor at the time was that Olympias, Alexander's mother, had poisoned his mind to prevent him from being a rival for her son's throne. She she was counting on Alexander to succeed Philip, her husband, and didn't want any any competitors. But we don't know anything about that. It, it's probably just another conspiracy theory. Um, so Antigonus and, and Demetrius make quite a great, uh, they're, they're a great team together, really, aren't they? But they have a fascinating rivalry with another successor. Eumenes, who's on, only on the scene for a little bit, and I always find Eumenes is another hugely attractive figure who starts out as a bit of a a swat. He's a he he's a learned man. He writes letters for Philip and then Alexander, but then he sort of has a career change and becomes a brilliant general. Yes. So my earlier book on the successors, Ghost on the Throne, which you, you referenced, centers largely around Eumenes because for the first seven years after Alexander's death. He seemed to have the most promise of holding the empire together, keeping it united under the reign of Alexander the Fourth, and that does make him an attractive figure. He was the loyalist, if you like, uh, the conciliere, if you're thinking in organized crime terms, which one can't help but do in this period. He was outside the royal line and non-Macedonian. He was a Greek and therefore not eligible for the throne himself, but wanted to hold it for Alexander IV until he could come of age, maybe at 13 or 14. And um, Antigonus being on the other side, being on the side of the Regency, if you like, how should we say, those who wanted to establish a new power center outside the royal family. Antigonus became the agent of that group and was tasked with bumping off Eumenes. And the two of them had a long duel, it goes on through much of Ghost on the Throne, the, the seven years after Alexander's death, which resulted finally in the, uh, the victory of Antigonus over Eumenes. Well, Demetrius, I really warm to Demetrius because he implores his father doesn't doesn't bump off Eumenes and to treat him honorably. Uh, so, I mean, that does does show a certain uh, maybe a youthful naivety, which the elder Demetrius probably wouldn't have have done. I don't know. Demetrius must have sort of changed over his life, didn't he, as his circumstances changed his character? Perhaps. Yes, we do hear that. When Antigonus captured Eumenes and had him as a prisoner and was planning to assassinate him, to to execute him at the strong behest of his army, that Demetrius stood up for keeping Eumenes alive and making him an ally. And 
I don't know if that sprang from some kind of human humanitarian impulse or simply good politics, because Eumenes was a very talented general. And if he had been incorporated into Antigonus's army, along with his loyal troops, that would have enormously strengthened their position. This happened once before that Antigonus had sought an alliance with Eumenes once before on the grounds that the two of them would make an amazing team. And uh, that fell through, but Demetrius was, I think, still hoping that it could happen. And Demetrius is, he really comes to the fore. As you say, Antigonus is quite an old man. And particularly when you consider 60 then wasn't 60 now, was it? So, so I guess Demetrius becomes Antigonus's his sort of art, oh, his, his, his weapon, yes. his battering ram. During this period that reading through your book, actually, the military innovations that are happening in the uh, in the Hellenistic period are just extraordinary. I mean, uh, th there are elephants that Alexander had brought over from from India, which are obviously on the scene. But it seems that Demetrius was a real. It was a bit of an entrepreneur for from for uh, patenting military uh, machinery and naval equipment. Was this from Demetrius himself, or were they all at it? A lot of them were at it, and it had started really with Philip, Alexander's father, who started using artillery weapons in new ways, torsion catapults that could fire, you know, good-sized stones at um, city walls to help break them down. And he was constantly improving these, and then Alexander carried that forward and Demetrius took it to a huge new level by making gigantic siege machines and gigantic naval warships and mounting siege machines on the warships and all kinds of innovations in an effort to win sieges primarily. These are mostly siege craft and hence his nickname, Demetrius the Besieger, which gets a little bit of an optimistic spin in my title, Demetrius Sacker of Cities. One of my readers pointed out it, he didn't actually sack that many cities. He tried several times and failed, notably at Rhodes, where he spent a year at a, on a siege and had to come up empty. So maybe besieger is a better moniker than Sacker of Cities. Yeah, in a way, I think that's that's the amazing thing about him is that he's just keeps he loves he, he sort of doesn't give up really, does he? When he is in front of city walls, despite ultimately, uh, yeah, as you say, not that much success besieging cities. Well, he did have a lot of success in Greece. We hear about his campaigns in Greece because the Greek cities at this time were part of the. Um, contest. You know, they were prizes in the contest. Whoever could dominate the western portion of the empire could claim sovereignty over the city-states of Greece. And Demetrius made a sweep through Greece that was enormously successful. And some of the cities capitulated as soon as they saw his siege weapons rolling up because they knew they couldn't withstand them. But at Rhodes which was his highest profile siege and the longest one. And he came very close to taking Rhodes, but finally had to give up after a, really a full year of combat. Well, you've mentioned Greek cities there, and, and there's one city that Demetrius has a special relationship really with throughout his life, and that's Athens. And and I think certainly to me as a reader, and having studied the 5th century Athens and, of course, into the 4th century, Athens is what fascinates about the uh, ancient Greek world. And presumably that was the case for everyone, people like Demetrius at the time as well. And so Athens and him have this, it is a bit of a roller coaster ride, but the, there is a special relationship between the two, isn't there? Yes, Going back to his father, who said that Athens was like a beacon that would broadcast the the image that the uh, Antigonids wanted to project to the rest of the Greek world. If you had the good opinion of Athens, you could be accepted anywhere in Hellas. So 
Demetrius at first was hugely successful in winning the hearts and minds of the Athenians. They practically divinized him. In fact, for all intents and purposes, they, they made him a god, him and his father. And then things went downhill to the point where in his last uh, return to Athens, after being kicked out a couple of times, he actually had to starve the city into submission in order to get back in. So as you say, it was uh, it was an up and down, first up and then down relationship, but a very intense one. And Athens was always the, the prize that he most coveted in Greece. But e- even with the ups, I can sense this sort of scholarly disappointment in your book with the city of Athens as it deifies Demetrius, because Democrats such as Demosthenes would be uh, Demosthenes and and before that, Pericles would be spinning in their graves, wouldn't they, if they knew that this is what Athens had become? Yes, and Demosthenes' nephew, Demokaris, was on the scene, was a political figure during this whole to and fro between Athens and Demetrius and was horrified at how the Athenians were behaving and actually was exiled, was was banished by the assembly in order to appease the pro-Demetrius faction. Yes, Athens had been a democracy until the time of Alexander and, you know, marginally was still a democratic constitution. But the um, forces of, I hesitate to say autocracy, because that's become such a dirty word, but of royalism were so strong in the period after Alexander's death, that Athens was swept along with the tide. And when they saw a strong man that was appealing, in part just because he was so good looking. Very <laughs> you know, important. Very important for the Athenians to have a beautiful and and youthful figure to uh, to adore. They just fell for him hook, line, and sinker. Do you think if Plutarch had paired him up not with Mark Antony, uh, a Roman. If you'd paired him up with another Greek, do you think Alcibiades would have been a good selection? Yes, he has a lot in common with Alcibiades. Alcibiades, who was also famously handsome, desirable for other men, and incredibly talented and incredibly ambitious, and also had a love-hate relationship with the city where they adored him and then they kicked him out and then they adored him again and then they kicked him out again. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. Wonderful stuff. I just wanted to briefly talk about the world of the successors. And so I'm sure you'll correct me if I get this wrong, but there are five main power bases, really. Egypt under Ptolemy, uh, Macedon under Cassander. Thrace is ruled by Lysimachus. So that's sort of northern between northern Greece and and Asia Minor. Asia Minor itself and Syria is under Antigonus and Demetrius. But then we see the rise of Seleucus in the Asia landmass of Iran and Mesopotamia. Well, the big change that occurs during the period of Demetrius's life is that the Antigonid power base, which once was all of Asia up to the Indus River, is slowly whittled away by Seleucus who establishes a base in Babylon and works his way westward and finally takes over virtually the entire Antigonid kingdom, that is, the Asian portion of of the former Alexander's empire. And at that point, Demetrius is sort of left homeless, (laughs) left without a power base, and has to resort to a naval strategy of uh, taking to the seas and dodging from one port to to another to rebuild his power. Well, they're all Macedonian. And so the kingship of Macedonia changes hands as well. But to start off with, Antipater dies because he's quite old. And and then eventually his son takes over, who you've mentioned before, Cassander. Now, I mentioned I don't like Cassander. I really do not. I find this man detestable. And he is responsible for ending the Argiad line, isn't he? Yes, in that he had Alexander IV killed and his mother Roxanne killed, and then eventually Alexander's illegitimate son Heracles 
So he bumped off anyone who could claim a a blood connection or a marital connection to Alexander. He also killed Olympias. Yes, he had Olympias killed after a uh, a civil war in in Europe. Now, you, of course, you're a, a hugely distinguished historian, and you wouldn't you wouldn't make the mistake of taking a like or a dislike to someone like Cassander. But I wanted to know what your view of him was. Yeah, I think anyone who studies this period has a dislike of Cassander. I think largely because of the murder of Alexander the Fourth. I mean, this was a young man who was born after his father's death. He had this crown thrust upon him, you know, as an infant and grew up being kicked around from one general to another, never had a life of his own and was almost at the point of uh, being able to reign. He was in his early teens, perhaps, when Cassander had him snuffed out. That murder has, you know, given Cassander a very bad name. He tried to make amends or or win back public opinion by giving Alexander IV a lavish and royal burial back in Macedon. And we have discovered that tomb uh, only about 50 years ago. And it's a fabulous tomb with all of its grave goods still intact and unplundered. So... We at least have, you know, a, a glorious last uh, picture of, of the life of Alexander the Fourth. Oh, interesting. So we, we should thank Cassandra for that, I suppose. <laughs> Having been there, I know what you mean. It is, it's stunning. And I recommend any any listeners, if they're heading to northern Greece, to go to the the royal tombs. But what was the impact in the world of his successors when they learned of Alexander the Fourth's murder? So... Antigonus had taken over the royalist position. That is, he stood up for the rights of Alexander IV more than any of the other successors. And we don't know whether that was just a cynical strategy that he intended to use this young man as a pawn or whether he really had any kind of loyalty to the Argead house. But in any case, Soon after Alexander the Fourth's death was known, the the successors began the process of creating kingships for themselves. Uh, Antigonus was the first to do that, and then followed quickly by Ptolemy and Lysimachus and Cassander. So all four of them began calling themselves kings within a few years of this this assassination. When Demetrius becomes king of of Macedon eventually, it's interesting reading because Plutarch talks about a sort of famous story when Demetrius is dismisses one of his subjects who asks him to intervene with some kind of problem, and he says, "Oh look, I'm you know I'm far too busy," and she dismisses him with a great line. And it's interesting to me, you'll probably uh, recite it a lot better than I will, but Plutarch talking about these successors and Demetrius is the perfect example of this. He just not happy ruling an assigned kingdom. They have to campaign, don't they? Yes. They'd all become addicted to military campaigning. They, they loved it. I mean, it was just the, the, the life that they'd become accustomed to and they never stopped. There was always another battle to fight or another piece of territory to try to carve off. And uh, when Demetrius was put in the position of reigning, that is, governing a country and seeing to the uh, domestic needs, he was a terrible failure. He he had no interest in it whatsoever. And so, as you say, a subject who petitioned him and uh, tried to get relief for some problem and was told, uh, well, I don't have the time. Uh, She's shot back, well, then don't be a king. That whole time that he was in charge of Macedon, which is a period in the early uh, early 3rd century BC, he was using all his resources to plan an invasion of Asia similar to that of Alexander that could potentially reunite the king, the the empire, and uh, give him another huge campaign that would occupy him for years. I suppose also there is this shadow of Alexander who is this, you know, I mean, Alexander, 
leaves this shadow over virtually all of subsequent antiquity, doesn't he? I mean, even Julius Caesar is it's talking about him hundreds of years later. But in the immediate aftermath, of, uh, you know, in the sort of 50 years after his death, everyone is trying to ape Alexander in some way, aren't they? Yes, he had set the template for what rulership was to be in the whole Hellenistic world. You had to be young, you had to have a smooth, uh, clean-shaven uh, face, which was a new innovation of Alexander's. And being handsome was enormously helpful, and with tremendous um, bravado and daring do, and a military daring do, willing to go out and, and lead a cavalry charge and, you know, with uh, galloping horses and, and go straight at your opponent full tilt. Those were the qualities Alexander embodied, and that became the template for all of his followers. And Demetrius was certainly, even to the point where uh, these commanders like to be on the right wing of the cavalry commanding the right wing, like Alexander did, there is this Demetrius at the Battle of Ipsus, which is this sort of seminal battle. And the numbers involved are just mind-boggling, really, even if you compare them with Alexander's campaigns, that, that if this is a bigger battle than any of uh, the battles during Alexander's reign. Well, I'm not sure that's true, because the Persian numbers in the Battle of Gogamela, for instance, were enormous. But you're right that it was certainly the biggest number of European troops that were ever on the field against one another up to this time. It was about eight, was it 80,000 on each side, roughly? Something like that, yeah. Which, I mean, one wonders how they fed them. Um, it's extraordinary. <laughs> Well, this was uh, uh, provisions were a big problem. There, there was a point at which one army started to lose troops because of inability to feed and and to pay such large numbers. But uh, by now, these generals were all very familiar with the growing seasons and the uh, fertile regions of Asia. They'd been up and down Asia with Alexander. And they they calculated their routes of march and their their campsites according to where they could find forage. Well, with Demetrius, such is the nature of life. As he's getting older, he's no longer the sort of great hope of the successors, and and a new rival emerges, one who many people actually think of as the greatest general of the ancient world, certainly up until Julius Caesar, Caesar, don't they? I mean, Hannibal obviously is in there, but I'm talking about Pyrrhus here, Pyrrhus of Epirus. Yes. What do you, what's your view on Pyrrhus? Well, Pyrrhus is a, is an attractive figure. He stood up to the Romans and, you know, we, yeah, we like the, that. and the Hellenic side of things. <laughs> I'm with you on this. <laughs> Can't help but feel attracted to someone who stands up to Rome. But yes, so Pyrrhus was initially on on Demetrius's side. He was Demetrius's right hand man initially, but soon developed his own ambitions and his own power base, and became a, a, a rival and an enemy. And very successfully, in one of Demetrius's later campaigns, peeled off troops from Demetrius's army because. He was the more attractive leader. He was the more Alexander-esque of the two, even though Demetrius had made that uh, his stock in trade, his resemblance to Alexander. Pyrrhus was better at it, and by that time was also younger. You know, he was closer in age to what uh, Alexander when he died, and was a, a big draw for defections. The other thing we should mention, actually, is that with all these dynasties. In actually, I suppose it's quite a small part of the world. They're all marrying relatives off each other, and and but Demetrius does have this incredibly quite a powerful uh, marriage with Phila, Phila. But she, she, they're married for a long time, even though he has 
I don't want to imply it's some kind of passionate love affair that they um, adored each other, but because he marries a number of times, doesn't he? But his his marriage with her is quite unusual. I got the impression. I don't know what what your view is on that. Well, it's hard to say what's what's usual because this is the first the first period in which the Greeks start practicing polygamy. Uh, the Macedonians had always allowed polygamy for the king. So Philip, we know, had seven wives, but now it becomes a more widespread practice for for those who can claim kingship. So Demetrius, as you said, marries several times and also has a famous love affair with a a very hot lady of her day, a woman named uh, Lamia, whose nickname was Lamia. But Villa stayed loyal and, and supportive and affectionate, we assume, all through his multiple marriages and affairs and brought up their two kids very um, skillfully so that they both became dynasts or, or helped found royal houses elsewhere uh, after Demetrius's death. So uh, it was regarded as a, um, you know, like Demetrius's relationship with his father, it was an unusually solid and stable relationship for its time. It's such an incestuous world in those during that period because all the successes, they're you know all their daughters are marrying sons and left, right, and center. I mean, it's very diff. As a historian, is it quite difficult to keep track of who's who? Do you have a do you have a spreadsheet or a map for family tree somewhere? Well, I mention in in the book that it's impossible to produce a a genealogical table for this period because. As you say, the interconnections are so complex, you need a 3D model to illustrate it. So, yes, I've done my best to keep everything straight for the for the reader. It's not an easy job. Uh, and it doesn't help that the names all get reused. So you have multiple Ptolemies, and you have uh, multiple Seleucuses, you know, they proliferate. But it's not unlike the mafia, the analogy I drew earlier, where the only loyalty that these families can count on is either blood, preferably, or marital ties. So they use marital ties to establish alliances, to defuse enmities. So people who are fighting each other on the battlefield one year would end up in-laws a few years later now i wanted to ask you and i don't know i I don't know how much of enthusiast you are of counterfactual history you might not like it at all do you go in for it in any way um i'm willing to give it a shot okay Uh, well well i was thinking because some historians don't like it but some do so i was thinking you know had alexander not died of illness and i think arabia was next on his hit list Mm mm-hmm would let's assume he took out Arabia fairly comfortably. That might be a big assumption. Was Rome and Carthage next on his list? Well, Rome was barely on his radar, being only a small power at that time. But yes, he planned to march across North Africa, which meant having to deal with Carthage and uh, establish a Western segment of his empire that would have been almost as extensive as his eastern holdings and so that would have meant that rome would have probably not grown into the world power that it was it would have maybe been a province of a macedonian empire and what happens from there is anyone's guess but uh, i think we can we can safely say that history would have looked a lot different it certainly would. Wow. I'm just trying to imagine what, you know, there would be a lot more. Um, well, I don't know what there would have been a lot more of. We might have had a lot more Greek roots of the English language than Latin. Greek might have been the lingua franca all the way to the Atlantic. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, James, look, this has been a real pleasure talking to you. Uh, uh, Demetrius, I don't want to go through his entire life bit by bit because people should read the book because it's actually it's it's the series that you've done that they're all quite short biographies aren't they we've had peter stothard on talking about crassus a few months ago 
they're wonder it's a wonderful series and you're the curator of this series as well so i wanted to thank you for that because they're such a joy to read they're very short under 200 pages and they open this opens up a a, a whole world to many who are probably unfamiliar with the world in the aftermath of alexander the great's death well i hope that's true the series is designed for general readers uh, there are very few footnotes or apparatus and lots of help for people who are not so familiar with ancient history. So uh, I hope it opens those doors. And as you say, it will continue for a good long while. We have almost 20 books in the pipeline at this point. Uh, it's a joy to hear. Well, James, thanks so much for your time and best of luck with the book. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening. Links are in the show notes. And as I mentioned at the start, coming up, I've got Napoleon's Invasion of Russia, The Hundred Years' War, and our film club. If you can please tell others about the podcast, I'd be hugely grateful. But until then, thank you and good night.